Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Causes or Cures. I'm Dr. Eeks, your host. Um, you can call me Eeks or Aaron, whatever you prefer. That's all good. Um, <laughs> I hope everyone is doing well, and thanks for joining in to today's episode. Today's episode, well, I just found it fascinating, mainly because it was an area I knew nothing zilch about, and it's a cautionary tale of multiple players and conflicting motivations, maybe some questionable motivations. Um, it's a story about people's health and life or death decisions, really. And so I think I think you'll find it fascinating too. Um, my guest today is David Chrisman. He is a filmmaker, a documentarian, documentarian, said that word right? <laughs> and he's a public health advocate. I just listened to his investigative documentary podcast series called The Great Social Experiment that tells the story and lessons of America's only experiment with universal health care, and that is the treatment of individuals with kidney failure. Um, again, I didn't even know that was a thing before listening to his podcast, but it is, and he is going to tell us all about it on today's episode and this fascinating tale um, and what we can learn from the great social experiment. All right, so give me a few seconds here while we connect to David. Okay, everybody, we are connecting with David Chrisman, and we're going to talk about the great social experiment, which is a podcast that I listened to fully. I really, really enjoyed it, really learned a lot. Um, but before we dive into that, David, do you mind just like sharing a little bit about yourself and, um, you know, how, what brought you to this podcast on mm -hmm. the way we treat kidney failure in this country and, and all just the topic in general of, you know, kidney failure and how it's, you know, the universal health experience and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I, I, so my again, my name is David Chrisman, and I have a background in uh, journalism and film production. So when I got out of college, I worked as a writer and editor in journalism and uh, eventually went to film school, but I had always written screenplays and loved it. It was like I did it literally every day before work, on vacation, on the weekends. It, it was always a passion of mine. And I read an article in the New York Times related to kidney failure and transplantation. And I, I wrote a script. Um, the script has to do with matching things that are not really in the podcast itself. And I got a posse of doctors and experts such as yourself to really help me wrap my head around this topic. And the more I learned, the more I realized that there was a larger story to be told uh, and arguably more important story, uh, which is not just um, matching once you get to the list and you're and you're on the list with a transplant center, but getting on the list in the first place. And as a person, I've seen the inefficiencies of our healthcare system. I've kind of been through the healthcare system myself. Um, and I guess you really don't appreciate something until you're standing in those shoes. Um, I don't have kidney failure. In fact, before this, uh, before this series, I really didn't know anybody who had kidney failure. Um, but I related to them in in a way because they are chronically not feeling well, and so so you have like that one element, and you have an interest in healthcare in another element, and with kidney failure, it's a universal system. Right. So if somebody has kidney failure in our country, it doesn't matter if they're nine years old or 70 years old, they will get brought into Medicare. And we can go into why they do this. But essentially, this should be the pinnacle of what's possible with our healthcare system. And in some ways, it's been good. And the fact that it's been a life raft for everybody who needs dialysis. And you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people per year um, who have this kind of this life raft, which is extending their lives. But dialysis is a, for, for the overwhelming majority of people, is a 
a miserable experience and a miserable life. Um, they're still chronically sick. Uh, they're just surviving as opposed to living, which is getting a transplant, right? You're able to, you actually get a kidney. And so unlike so many other diseases, not only do we have this universal aspect to it, but the treatments for it can be really boiled down to two things, dialysis or transplant, and they are not equal. And, and so much of our healthcare problems relates to the equity, cost, and access, right? Well, when you have a disease where there's literally two treatments and one of them is light years better than the other, you can then look at that as a really interesting case study and see who is succeeding and who doesn't. And in this case, the people who succeed are more or less reflective of the people who succeed in our larger healthcare system, which on the surface doesn't make any sense because again, it's universal. The government doesn't care uh, who's getting transplanted and who doesn't. They're just the payer. And so I delved into this story, learned a lot, and I'm really excited to be here and share with your audience what I have learned. You know, it's interesting because I don't even know how many people kn know this, um, that kidney failure is like a universal system. Yeah. No, I mean, a lot of, I would say most healthcare professionals don't know. Yeah. No, I mean, I was like, oh, really? Like, because it's just. Yeah. And you're in public health, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I was like. I didn't know that. I think, and so I learned from your podcast. Um, so this was since 1972. Since 1972, uh, Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon. Okay. No matter okay. what you feel about him. Right. <laughs> this is something he did with Congress, which was good. Right. Right. right? I mean, and I, you know, like I went to public health school, medical school, and like this, we never talk about this, you know, like I was, so I was just intrigued by it. Um so you 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 described it, you introduced it, I think, very well, kind of giving, you know, the audience what we're gonna hear. But let's let's start from the beginning. Um, like how did this come about? Like how did this experiment start? Got it. So if you go back to the 1960s, the early 1960s in Seattle is when they really made the first breakthrough with outpatient dialysis. Now, what do I mean by outpatient dialysis? Before the 1960s, they were able to do dialysis, but they weren't able to do it in an outpatient setting, meaning come and go. And the reason why is because every time they did dialysis on a patient, they couldn't reuse that access site in their bloodstream because it would basically destroy it. And so I, I kind of liken it to this uh, analogy, you know, say, say you had a plot of land and you're in the middle of nowhere. And every time you watered the ground, you would get food, but you would also poison the soil at the same time. You would eventually run out of area in which to grow food. And, and in the case of dialysis, it would destroy the access site and you only have so many access sites on your body in which you can really access the bloodstream in a way that's viable for dialysis. So they really didn't try it. You know, for some, for people with acute kidney failure where their kidneys could recover, they would do dialysis. Um, the patient would be in the hospital, they would recover and they get them off dialysis. But for people whose kidneys had actually failed, this wasn't a, a long-term solution. And um, then a doctor uh, who was a professor at the University of Washington and who was affiliated with Swedish Hospital, I believe, invented, this is right when Teflon came onto the market. Teflon is more or less the nonstick material on your frying pan, right? And the reason why this was so big was that the reason why they couldn't kind of create a port in which they could access the bloodstream multiple times was because the there would there would be blood clots and because of teflon and because it things the blood didn't stick so well 
it, it didn't it didn't create that problem. And so they they set up this clinic and I believe they had three machines, but they had an overwhelming number of patients who needed it, about 50 times what they could accommodate. And, and so they had no idea on who to give this a treatment to. And so what they ended up doing is creating what was called uh, the Life and Death Committee or some people referred to it as the God committee, which was seven lay people that essentially decided whose lives were worth extending. And I mean, it's a, it's crazy. Cause I remember when we had the ACA debates and people were like, ah, you know, death panel, the government shouldn't be involved, but this really was a life and death. This committee. was a death panel. <laughs> <laughs> this was a, I mean, it was, I would think that they would say it's a life panel. And life and the panel, crazy yeah. part is none of them, there was a minister, a housewife, a labor leader. There's like seven of them. And, and none of them really wanted to do this, but they all realized that somebody had to decide whose lives are worth extending. And so what they ended up doing is you know, they would get like a case file and you know, judge them by their contribution to society and their family. Um, so in the early 1960s, your best chance of survival, if you had kidney failure in Washington state, was to be a middle-class man with children to support. Because if you were, if you were really wealthy, then they figured, ah, oh, well, your, your widow could, could take care of the kids. So, I mean, it, 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 it was kind of crazy. Um, and so this was going on for about 10 years. Um, there was multiple hospitals throughout the United States that decided to open up dialysis clinics, but it was a very, very uh, inaccessible procedure to the overwhelming majority of the people who needed it. And Life magazine covered this life and death committee, and there was an outcry. You you saw their faces; they were silhouetted in black because they didn't want their identities to be to be revealed. And this is really what most people attribute to the beginning of bioethics in our country. Kind of that's where it started. Um, and of course, we've seen this play out in multiple different ways when it, even as recently with the vaccines and who gets it first, et cetera. Mm. Um, yeah. But in 1972, the Congress basically said, Oh, okay. We're not going to have, you know, it's unaffordable for most people. It's inaccessible for most people. We'll start to pay for it and we'll save these lives. At that time, there was about 10,000 people. They estimate that needed it in the country. They never foresaw the problem we have today, which is about 600,000. There are more people in our country that need dialysis who will die if they're not hooked up to a machine at least three times a week than the whole population of Wyoming. And we, as a country, pay for it. So let's talk about, you haven't, um session episode two called perverse incentives um yes. linked <laughs> yes linked. yes it's a good title i was like that sounds interesting um linked <laughs> <laughs> to the rise of these dialysis centers um a quote something you said in there that caught my ear was you said we have we now have more dialysis centers than burger kings correct that's a lot that's a lot that's a lot i mean just you in my small more... town i grew up i had like four burger kings like oh where did you grow up uh, Trucksville, Pennsylvania, not oh. right in Trucksville. We had one in Trucksville, like, but like the adjacent small towns, like, like right. there's always a Burger King. Yeah. Right. Well, yes. Yes. <laughs> Especially if you live off a freeway or something like yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Like I, yeah. I, I used, yeah, I lived right off of a highway. Right. Um, yeah. Really we have more town. clinics in this country than Burger Kings. Than Burger Kings. Wow. That's incredible. Um, and it's one of those things that just sticks in your head. And yeah. so, okay, so we're talking about, you know, when you think dialysis center and just, you know, to emphasize, you need to hook up to this machine in a dialysis center. And this machine essentially 
does what your kidney is supposed to do for you. It's It, fills it does it. a yeah. fraction of a what fraction. a kidney will do. Okay. Um, okay. It So kidneys do a lot of things yes. besides filter your blood. Yeah. Uh, they help regulate hormones, yeah. blood pressure, yeah. all of these things yeah. that we take for granted that yes. just kind of magically happen. Um, but the, one of their biggest jobs is to produce urine. So it takes the fluid. They basically produce fluid and you pee it out without kidneys. You don't produce urine and you don't pee. Right. So imagine if that fluid was building up in your body, it would put a lot of pressure on your heart. There would be toxins. And so what dialysis does is it helps filter those toxins and then it takes off that water weight. Right. Um, and if you're doing this 24 seven, like we are, you don't even notice it, but when you do it three times a week, I mean, I don't know if this is the best analogy, but imagine only being able to pee three times a week. You, yeah. Nope. You'd be nope, like, oh, this, is, <laughs> yeah, this, this doesn't seem too good, right? Not, not um, with the levels of coffee I drink. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I've got tea right here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, um, so it is very debilitating on patients and, uh, Medicare usually only pays for, you know, maybe three times a week. Some patients do get more, but I, you know, and I really don't know the process of that. Uh, I'm sure the doctor has to be involved. Um, but it's just, just barely enough to survive. You know, when you go back to the beginning, it was like, okay, they did it one day a week and people weren't living long. Then they did it two days a week and they still weren't living that long. And so three days was kind of like, ah, oh, okay, here's the least amount of money that we should be paying, even though it's really not the best for patients. Um, if patients got five, six days a week, seven days a week, they'd be better off, but that's a whole different story. But uh, anyways, back to perverse incentives. No, I, no, I appreciate all this, uh, this detail. Um, because uh, I, I, like I said, I think it's just not commonly known here. So these centers, there are po tons popping up. Obviously you need them to survive. Right. People need them to survive. Right. Um, but then, you know, also you can see how people might view them as ways to make money. So I wanted to ask you, can you talk a little bit about who owns these centers? Yeah. So I'll give you a little historical context. The if you go back to the 90s, I would say about 80% of dialysis clinics were locally owned and operated, which means there were basically independent clinics owned by doctors and hospitals, right? And But things started to change um, and corporations got involved. And uh, by the time 10, 12 years goes by, uh, the, the market basically inverts. And these chains, particularly to Davida and, and Fresenius, go on this major buying spree and basically gobble up 70 to 80% of these clinics and leave 20% to independent doctors and hospitals. Um, and frankly, I don't even think most, ho well, I think uh, most hospitals now outsource this to Davida and Fresenius. They don't even really do it themselves. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't. I know uh, a couple of local big hospitals in Los Angeles that work directly with these companies um, because it's cheaper and they've they've gotten it to they've they've made it more efficient in terms of patients and and processing patients through the system. Um, but as corporations, their primary objective has always been to make money, right? This was an investment opportunity uh, or sorry, a business opportunity that Medicare essentially created when they just said, Hey, you, this is guaranteed payment. And so what ended up happening was not only were they expanding, but they, but they started to process more patients through the, the, the personnel, they basically um, the the education and the talent of the personnel kind of went down. So before there was more nurses, now there's more technicians. 
Um, and technicians are, they're, they're great. They're wonderful people, but they're lower skilled and they don't, they're not paid as well. Right. And so they're saving money, pushing patients through and, and the quality of care s- seems to be going down. Right. And patients take note of it. Right. If you ask a lot of them, a lot of them will say it's like an assembly line. Um, that is so, yeah. So, but when it comes to perverse incentives, you, when we go back to what is the better of the two treatments? Well, a transplant is, but the more patients that these clinics have, the more money they make. And the more patients that get a transplant, you could argue the less money, you know, that's, that's an empty dialysis chair, right? Once you get a transplant, you don't need this anymore. Right. And so the clinics themselves don't have a financial incentive to get patients transplanted. And this is a problem because Medicare has basically given them the responsibility to educate patients about transplant. It says that the clinic shall, right? Well, first of all, who is that? And that stood out to me um, in your podcast because you talk a lot about the educational factor in in a couple of the episodes and whose role is it to tell patients what their options are to educate them about transplant and, you know, the benefits, uh, maybe the risks, that kind of thing. So you're yeah. saying it's these centers, it's their responsibility. It's their responsibility in the eyes of Medicare, right? But then there's the Hippocratic Oath. And this is where it gets more complicated because every patient that's in a dialysis chair, their care needs to be overseen by a nephrologist, right? Sure. Sure. And the nephrologist is paid in a capitated way, which means that they are paid per patient that they oversee. So they make you know, whatever it is, like $250 or $300, depending on where they are in the country, for every patient's care that they oversee on dialysis. Well, if that's the way you're paid, your incentive is to have as many patients as possible, which means you're spending time with fewer patients, well, you're spending less time with each patient and you're also, you don't have a financial incentive to get them transplanted because once they get transplanted, their follow-up care is going to be quite a bit less. If, if, if at all, a lot of, a lot of people get transplanted, have their follow-up care by a transplant nephrologist, which is at the transplant center, not the nephrologist who oversees dialysis. But in our country, the overwhelming of nef- the overwhelming amount of nephrologists are not transplant nephrologists. Now, you know, those people make up maybe 10%, 90%. The bulk of their money comes from patients whose dialysis they oversee. Okay. Okay. And and just to, to be clear, the cost effective analysis on average um, of dialysis versus Transplant, transplant and and you know health benefits from the taxpayer right so so a transplant from the taxpayer perspective pays for itself in about a year and a half to two years right it's a it's it's a one time procedure and then the biggest cost after that are immunosuppressive medications so that the patients don't go into rejection because they have this foreign object object in them now, which is the new kidney, right? Um, but it's, you know, it's a it's one surgery. And I if it's a living donor, it could last more than 20, 30 years. Um deceased donors, perhaps two, uh, but they they last on average maybe half uh as those from living donors. So a transplant, the more transplants, the better in terms of funding all this. Um, and if you get a lot of patients transplanted, it will save us billions of dollars because dialysis is so expensive, right? So let's just say a transplant's like a hundred grand or 115, 20 grand. Dialysis is about 75, 80, 90 grand per year. So you can do the math. And who covers, say somebody gets a transplant and they need to get on these immunosuppressor drugs? The immunosuppressive drugs? Yeah. Um, 
Well, for now, now the government does. The government does cover it, but they before they would only cover it for the first three years. Now, if you don't have private insurance, I believe they cover it because they realized that some of their patients were stopping, uh, had stopped taking them after three years. And so, because they just couldn't afford them. <laughs> okay. uh, and then they would go yeah. back into rejection and then they would go back onto dialysis and right. then the government would have to pay for that dialysis again, uh, right? Okay. And so it was bad public policy, which people were pleading for them to change for like decades. And they finally did uh, more or less during the pandemic. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. And the government doesn't do anything in terms of education. Sounded no. terrible. But <laughs> no, 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 no. Government I mean, doesn't they, do anything, but um, they, the government like, is um, the payer. The payer. They're, that's all they do. Right. Okay. Right. So they're relying on the clinics, the dialysis clinics, the doctor, the nephrologist at the clinic, I'm assuming, or maybe other staff members to do the education about the possibility right. of the transplant. Right in which case there's no financial incentive at all for those folks to do that. No, fact, and yeah. not, yeah, you know, look, I, I use financial incentive because a lot of these people, they have good hearts. Yeah. Um, they, they try hard, but I would say the majority of the people that are doing the education are social workers now, not even the doctors. And, uh, I mean, the doctors, a lot of doctors will mention it, but the education, at least from the clinic's perspective, who are supposed to be doing the education, it comes from a social worker, but that's just one of a long list of jobs that the social worker has. And they often have like hundreds of patients. And so like, imagine getting educated about chemotherapy for like five minutes or 10 minutes or, or whatever it is. A lot of them just say, Hey, you want to transplant? Okay. We'll, we'll refer you to the center. And then sometimes they don't even hear back from the center there's no, it's not particularly organized, right? Um, and so there's not a lot of education and there's not a lot of follow through um, from either the transplants center side or the dialysis clinic side. Um, and these patients are so sick that, yeah, maybe they don't feel good when they, when they're supposed to get an evaluation or maybe they forget or, um, you know, 80% of them are not working, it's estimated, because it's just too difficult on their bodies and the dialysis process takes so much time. Right. So um, so they're just not doing a good job giving the information. That's right. the best way to put it. Right, right, right. And I think a lot of if you know the health for the healthcare workers who listen to this podcast can relate to that because there's so much pressure to see so many patients a day exactly. and, yeah, um, and fill out all this paperwork. Um, you just really don't have even that time, even if you wanted to, it's, it's hard to find time to properly educate someone. This is one example we're talking about, but we could talk about it, you know, in terms of healthy weight loss, you know, or anything. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's just, right. Um, yeah. We don't, well, our you system know, one of the patients, yeah, one of the patients that, uh, and, and it's preventive care too. So one of the patients that I talked to never lived a healthy life. He was always told what he called the routine, which is you know limit your salts, stop, uh, you know, I mean he was he was obese, right? And um, and he was always told that he had a high creatinine level, right? But what does that mean? Well, a simple Google search would tell you, well, your kidneys aren't functioning well, but it's the difference in communication, not just time, but the style of communication where you, where they say, hey, you should really limit your salts. You have a high creatinine level, right? Or you could say, hey, do you want to lose your kidneys? Because your kidneys are, 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 are being destroyed and you're doing that and you're going to end up on this machine. I mean, think about the anti-smoking campaign. I mean, it was cool to smoke. And then all of a sudden people started seeing these commercials with people that had holes in their throats, you know, who are talking like this, right? And so in in some ways, I think it, it's it's the time. We know it's the time, but I think, and also, it's also how it's communicated, um, which is a problem. Yeah, yeah. Communication is, 
you have to, I guess you have to like connect, you have to, it's like an art, you know, you have to be able to connect to the patient and know what's going to, you know, maybe motivate them or get them right. to understand the situation. Um, sometimes you risk pissing people off, right? Like, so it's- right. Yeah, we live in a litigious world. I'm yeah. You know, so, uh, <laughs> so people people are scared to Same, you know, yeah, very a, much so. Right, yeah. Um, um, but you know, when it comes to perverse incentives, it gets worse, and it gets worse because in, in general, when most patients, because we don't have good preventive care, um, and because we eat a lot of really bad food, uh, and we don't watch our diets, about fifty percent of patients crash into dialysis. It's an, it's an asymptomatic disease until it's too late, right? Which means they wake up one day and they're like, holy crap, I don't feel good. The ambulance comes, takes them to the hospital. And while they're in the hospital, they're like, hey, dude, you've got kidney failure. And they're like, what's that? And, you know, they might explain a little bit to them. And that person will see a nephrologist, a kidney doctor, right? And the nephrologist will say, inevitably, you need to have, you need to start dialysis like now, and we're going to set you up at the clinic. And so they're sent to a clinic. Um, but what that patient doesn't know is that many, 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 many independent doctors in our country, including academic institutions have, um, financial interest in these clinics. So not only are they getting paid you know, the doctors per capita, but they're also getting money on the back end from the dialysis care, right? So these, these centers, uh, the clinics, the corporations really smart when it comes to business, they're like, all right, well, who, who, who are the entities that are sending us these patients? Well, those are the doctors. Well, the doctors are going to send patients to clinics that they have a financial stake in, right? And so when it comes to transplantation, the clinics don't have an interest. The doctors don't have a financial interest. And they also have a deeper perverse incentive because they make money on the back end. Um, and so if you were to design a system to give patients a second chance at life, this would be the complete opposite of what you would want to do. And you talked a little bit about this in your podcast when uh, I think you said, or you expressed the sentiment that some doctors are like, oh, what's the point of referring right. patients to this list? There's right. not enough organs to go around. Right, right. Um, so you can break this down into two things. One, it's an equity issue, right? So you could say, so what? But like, it's like everybody deserves a chance to survive. Um, even for example, even if even if they have cancer and they wouldn't be allowed to be put on the wait list for a couple of years until they're in remission anyways, or maybe five years, depending on the center, um, they should still know that this is an option downstream, right? So that they can find a living donor. And, and, and that's the second part of it. It's not just the, the ethics of giving them the information. It's the fact that humans have two kidneys, but we only need one to live a normal life. The other can be donated. And that really is the quickest and easiest way to bypass this wait list. So on average, a dialysis, a dialysis patient's life expectancy in our country is about three years, right? After five years, 50% of them will either have died or they'll still be waiting. It's the chances are not good, right? Um, and so if you take that and you now know that the average wait for a transplant is three to five years for a deceased donor, that presents a problem. Now, some of these, pa some of these patients are healthier and they'll be able to survive on dialysis longer, right? They're not, they don't have all the comorbidities as other as other patients, right? But your your chance is not good, right? And so if you get a living donor, not only will your kidney last on average twice as long, 
but you'll be able to bypass this list, which means you're not going to spend years on dialysis, which means you're going to be healthier and that kidney will last even longer because you just haven't been subjected to all of that, all those years of dialysis. And the the wait will be shorter uh, because the, li the living donor doesn't have to know who you are. You can donate to a stranger. You can totally donate to a stranger. Okay. Okay. And, this, yeah. and you're just saying the weight would be less just based off of the, the amount. Well, it would be less because when you're waiting those three to five years in California, it's up to 10 years. It's because you're waiting for somebody else to die so that you can live. You're waiting yeah. for a deceased donor. If you have a living donor, yeah, you can bypass that. Or you can make it a lot shorter if you're already on the list, right? Right. right. Um, living donation is safe. Um, it's preferred for a, a lot of reasons, but our strategy in the United States has been to improve deceased donation, which is probably the, I mean, I think we need it, but we should have for decades been prioritizing living donation uh, in the same way that we prioritized getting people to stop smoking because there are so many advantages. I Think of deceased, there's so many things that have to go right for a deceased donor to be able to donate an organ. So they have to die in the right way, which is about one in a thousand people, right? This is usually brain death as opposed to cardiac. Right. And so if they if they're getting in an accident, they hit their head and they die a brain death, but their but their blood circulation can keep on going and they can they can save the organs, then the family usually needs to agree for their organs to be donated, the, the next of kin. Right. And then they have to find a match. And then it's it's just a, imagine a relationship right where where the sex is great okay <laughs> but everything else is just dysfunctional and so you stay in it kind of <laughs> because that's familiar the, i've been there <laughs> you're right 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 no amount of therapists like couples relationship therapists are going to be able to improve this system right sorry this this relationship and that is really, well, we have been able to make marginal improvements over the years with deceased donation. Um, it's such a dysfunctional race to get people transplanted that no, you know, it, it's like banging something right now, put it this way, the biggest, the biggest increase that we've had in deceased donation has been in the last 10 years. And that's not because they've been so much more efficient. It's because of the opioid epidemic that people have been overdosing. Right. And so, oh, yeah. 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 So there's been this, there's been this temporary steep incline in deceased donors, but it's just because people are dying because they're overdosing. Right. Whereas so that's such a sad statement it, of, on the United States. Like, it's a huge, it's a very, very sad statement on yeah. the United States. Look, when you compare the logistics of getting somebody's organs in California who died on a highway into a patient in New York or in Arizona or whatever, the logistics are insane. Now compare that with living donation. It's like, all right. Well, what, when's good for you? Should we do like three o'clock? <laughs> Would you like to eat lunch first? I mean, I mean, that's obvious. I, I'm kidding, but there's, there's really no logistical hurdles when it comes to living donation. It's the biggest barrier is finding that living donor. And that is actually what the next phase of the great social experiment is. is what to is the yeah. average time from a deceased donor, you, you get the kidney and you know, the, the time between putting it in somebody else. Yeah. It goes up to two days. So well, a lot so of only, so you have 48 hours. About. It depends on the center. Right. Okay. We okay. have 250 something centers in the United States and they all have their own protocols and, and ways of doing things. And, but I know that there are centers that will take 
organs that have already been on ice for up to two days. Okay. Right? okay. Yeah. So let's talk about the transplant centers because I, this is a whole world I don't know. So I, I was really intrigued when I was listening to your podcast. Sure. Um, so in the one part where you talk about who gets the kidney, who's chosen right. to get the kidney. Um, right. And I was intrigued and it was also kind of sad to, to read about it. But one thing that caught my mind was um, sometimes a kidney will be rejected by multiple transplant sites. And then there's a transplant site that says, oh, we're going to use this kidney and puts it in someone. Um, and all those people that were skipped over at the other trans, the earlier transplant sites had no idea that this was even on the table. And right. then this kidney gets this other transplant center says, okay, sure, we'll use this kidney right. and then gives it to someone. And that per patient presumably does okay. Right. Yeah. And that seems crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, ex it, w that episode was probably, and the, and the, the doctor that I interviewed Summit Mohan, um, he's brilliant, just absolutely brilliant, but him, uh, another brilliant doctor, Rachel Patzer, um, and, and some others, they have done research, which kind of pulls back the curtain on what happens and with with organ acceptance in the United States, right? So right now, we are literally tossing one out of every five kidneys in the trash. Sorry, one out of every four, about one out of every four of those kidneys are being tossed in the trash. And a lot of them, about 60% of those, it's because they have no, no transplant center agreed to take them, which seems insane. So you have somebody, I'm, I'm just putting this in perspective and then, uh, then I'll answer what, what you brought up. Um, but you know, imagine your 19 year old son, for example, is in a car crash and, uh, doesn't even have to be on it. Let's just say, uh, a 40 year old, right. Car crash, uh, rush to the hospital. They can't save his life, but they can save his organs. And you're the wife of that man. And you say, okay. And so they basically cut them open and they take all the organs that they can, you know, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, et cetera. And then you find out that they were not put to use. So that's heartbreaking from, from the donor family side to start. And, and there's multiple reasons why this happens. Um, but it is essentially um, because transplant centers, mostly the transplant surgeons in our country, and it's not malicious, right, um, have a say on which organs they are willing to transplant. So if you go back to, I believe it was 2008, and this is an example of bad public policy. Medicare decided that they was that they were going to create scorecards for transplant centers on the life expectancy of the organ and the life expectancy of the person in the first year, right? So how how many of their organs did well and how many of them went into rejection in, in the first year, right? So the transplant center then says, okay, well, if you're going to give us scorecards and then put us on probation, if we're not higher than the average center, then we're only going to take the best patients and the best and the best organs, right? Because if that will give us a good scorecard and then we don't have to worry about being put on probation, right? And so what you see over the course of like 10 years is is stagnation in the amount of transplants that are happening in this country. And it becomes much, much more difficult for patients to get on the wait list because the transplant centers are now more picky about who they're willing to accept in the program, right? Uh, you got to remember, they have, there is, there is 
for a lot of these centers, there's no shortage of clients and customers, right? Right. right. And so they they can then become more picky and choosy. And that's what they did. And so right now you have 88,000 people who are on the wait list for a transplant. And this has gone down from about 100,000. Now, most people hear that and they think, well, that's fantastic. There are more, that that means there's there's less people who need a kidney, but it couldn't be further from the truth because we know that there are 600,000 people in this country who are on dialysis. And what I found through my own reporting is that the the amount of patients that should be on the list is not the 13, 14% that are, that are on it of that 600,000. It's, it should be over 50%. And so because these dialysis clinics and the doctors, they don't have an, a financial incentive to get these patients a transplant. And because the transplant centers have been more picky and choosy about which patients they're, they're allowed they're allowing into their program, the amount of people has steadily and continually gone down, which means people who need access, not even a guarantee to for an organ, but at least you would say access to the better of two treatments, they're not even getting on the list, right? And so um, what ends up happening is, so that's half the, the issue, which is th- th- that you are talking about, which is, patients actually getting accepted in the first place. Right. But they're also saying, you know, uh, we only want the best organs. So, so let's say there's two people, right. Who are, who have been killed. One of them's a 19 year old athlete and one of them is a 65 year old diabetic. Well, uh, clearly one of those is better. One of my closest friends who I'm working on this project with she is a she is a recipient of a deceased organ and her kidney function is better than mine because she had a, a kidney from a 19 year old right so so that's like that's like gold for for the transplant center right and so they'll say you know what we'll pass on this 65 year old kidney who has who's a little diabetic even though that kidney could benefit someone and give them many, many more years of life. They still pass on that, right? And so then you're, so say that kidney's in in California, right? There is a completely objective algorithm that decides who gets this kidney, right? And so they give it to, they, they offer it to someone, say, in California. But all these California transplant centers decide you know what, we're going to pass. And so by the time the kidney is being offered to somebody in Colorado or the Midwest, the surgeons are looking at this going, wait, why is everybody passing on this kidney? Yeah, <laughs> It's like, I liken it to, you know, somebody who's 40 and single, right? <laughs> a, a dude who's 40 and single Oh, uh, I you know that's yeah that old thing like there's something wrong with them or something. There's yeah. something you know yeah. we don't know what it is, right? Yeah. That's how people the, think. The, the yeah. sky is seemingly attractive, right? But you must be a serial there killer. There's yeah. something wrong with them, <laughs> right? And so what happens is a lot of these organs, for multiple reasons, they get passed on by literally every single transplant center in the United States for literally all their patients, right? And these patients aren't told about it. And that is a humongous problem, right? Because let's say you just got on dialysis. Say you're like, you know, 67 years old, right? And the transplant center says, all right, we'll put you on our list. And you get offered an organ, maybe two weeks, two weeks later, because so many other transplant centers have passed on this organ. Okay, so that organ may last you, let's just say it'll last you eight years, eight years of good health. You can spend time with your grandchildren, maybe even 10 years, right? But you're not told about it. And as a consequence, you die after four years. So there's so much passing over, uh, passing on organs, 
that literally 50% of people on the wait list will get an organ offer within two weeks and they don't know about it. And, 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 and you talk about how you can make this process better. Like you can ask, you know, and so like, let's go back to that person. If you say, Hey, you can get this kidney. It's not a perfect kidney. It's been through some stuff. Um, but it might give you 10 years of life and you won't be hooked up to this dialysis machine. You won't right? feel chronically sick. Right. You won't feel sick all the time. So could, let's see 10 years of good quality life. Um, and, and you're saying I, in the podcast, you say you can, there is a way to make this more patient centered, meaning you can include the patients in this decision process. Um, so not, so it's not just the transplant surgeons, maybe, uh, you know, for all the other reasons you mentioned. Yeah. Deciding. Yeah. yeah. So a, a surgeon would tell you, and by the way, these are not necessarily just my ideas that they, oops, I think I just knocked my mic. Um, these are not my ideas. I didn't wake up one morning. I'd be like, you know what? I have a good way to solve this problem. <laughs> right. Oh, no, I, just, I listened to yeah. your podcast. Yeah, so but, we're, we're... <laughs> but the thing is, you know, the, the, there's a huge irony to this, right? And the irony to this is that two thirds of that, that the whole transplant system is in business because of ang asynchronous decision-making. And what do I mean by that? I mean that a surgeon will tell you, hey, well, you know, we don't have very much time to talk to these patients. It's often happening in the middle of the night, and we have to make a decision fast. But you could have talked to that patient when you first met them and said, hey, here are the benefits of, of accepting an organ, which may not be the best organ, but hey, we might be able to get you off the, the wait list much faster. And considering your condition and how old you are, you will do better. Right. Um, well, this asynchronous decision making, which is happening ahead of time, is the only reason why these deceased donors are deceased organs are being used in the first place. It's because I went to the DMV and I decided while I was at the DMV that if I die someday in the future, I want my organs to be donated. So surely if we can do that to provide these organs so that there is a business to be had these surgeons can 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 talk to their patients and discuss you know what might be better for them um and and bring them in on the conversation i'm not saying that these conversations are um easy or that they that there are not complications but that the patient should be involved yeah yeah um but their ratings so might go down but the, well, so, so, so here's the <laughs> Not thing. Not that that I, matters to me, but like, and that was, I, I didn't mean that from like, I'm just saying, is that rating system still? It is, but it's not, it's not. Medicare has since said, oops, we screwed up and they have stopped doing it, but private insurers have not. And private insurers pay for, I don't know, 20, 30% of these transplants. Right. And and so if you want to be a whatever, like a quote unquote center of excellence, you need to perform. And if you have, if if you're lowering your marks because you are being more aggressive in terms of trying to get patients transplanted, that could, you know, you could wake up, you know, the next year and be like, oh, United Healthcare is not covering us, which means, you know, a big chunk of our patients have to either go somewhere else or are being uh, referred to somewhere else. Right. And so it's a problem. So in the podcast, and I'll, I'll just kind of, I think I want to talk more about living donors and how that can help out here, uh, be part of the solution. But I, I really like this quote and um, towards the end of your podcast, when you say, um, you wrote down a quote that I that well, I I, it's not your, it's like, I, it's like you said it. That's what I mean by quote. Oh God, I'm so flattered. Somebody. I did. I actually, I, <laughs> I did. I said myself for this. Well, okay. I'm probably like paraphrasing, but the idea okay. like healthcare in this country does not prioritize health. And you kept repeating volume over value. Correct. Yes. So, this is a big, this is a big subject I'm sure for you in public health. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's massive. Um, yeah. but I mean, everything we do, yeah in our country is based on volume, right? And um, 
we don't prioritize keeping people healthy, even in primary care, which these doctors should be paid more. They should, we should have far more than the huge deficit that we do. Um, if they were given time with each of their patients, then a lot of these patients probably wouldn't get kidney failure in the first place, right? Because, because they would make a connection with the patient that said, Hey, I know you, I know you like French fries, but you really need to stop. You know, some patients would say, you know, they wouldn't be able to control themselves and some would. Right. But certainly we would have fewer patients that were crashing into dialysis. Right. Uh, and this is just like type two diabetes and high blood pressure. Things yeah, that are very leading, common. Right. right. The leading causes of kidney failure in our country are type two diabetes and high blood pressure. And these are things that not only can be possibly cured at uh, possibly, but they can certainly be managed. Um, and we just, don't as a country prioritize that we prioritize fixing diseases or at least trying to fix them or manage them once it has gotten so bad you know there really isn't a perfect health care system right uh in the world because healthcare in and of itself is a system where you can't control the outcomes of everybody, right? Some people are just going to die. Some people are going to get sick, but there's also, it's also complicated. It is more complicated. And I'm sure you learned this a long time ago than any other system in our country. So let me give you an example. Let's say we're in, let's take you back to 2020. And let's say there's a COVID unit. You're in New York, in New York city. And that COVID unit had a death rate of 50% which let's just say for argument's sake is about 40% more than the average COVID unit. What would your first inclination be if you were a policymaker? Um, maybe not to, if I had to like decide on who I'm giving money to. Yeah. Like, I mean, what would you do? Would I'd be you, a little concerned. You would be concerned, right? And, and a lot yeah. of people say, oh, we got to shut them down. But then what if you then learned that this COVID unit had the best doctors in all of New York City, and as a consequence of that, they were sent the most difficult, hard-to-treat patients? Oh, okay. Well, now, now you're looking at it in a different perspective. So how do you pay people like that? Right? It's... Um, Healthcare is incredibly complicated. And right now we, unlike, unlike the restaurant owner that has an incentive, a volume incentive, they, they provide uh, good food. They've got a, a, a line around the block on Friday and Saturday night for people who want to dine there. They want to keep a full house. But in healthcare, we want our dialysis clinics and our hospitals to be empty. It's never going to happen, but that's, that's what we want to aim for. And the way we spend money in healthcare is the reverse. We don't catch things before they're too late. And then we spend a ton, a ton of money to try and mitigate problems once the situation has gotten to be an emergency. Yep. It's yeah. like that across the board. It's like that across the board. Yeah. And when you you take that, so you have a system where the patients, where we have what 40% of our patients are underinsured, right? So there's no financial incentive for patients to go to the doctor, particularly if you've got a family that you're trying to feed, that you're just trying to stay in the middle class. It's like, okay, this can wait. Meanwhile, your kidneys deteriorating. Like if right. you, the idea so, is like, oh, if I have to go create a GoFundMe account to like pay for this, like forget yeah. it. Forget it, right? And yeah. and that is all too common in our country. So you don't have an a financial insist, uh, incentive as a patient to see the to see a doc to see a doctor. Excuse me. 
And as a doctor, you don't have a financial incentive to spend time with patients. So from both directions, we aren't prioritizing health. We're prioritizing getting into the doctor and sorry, uh, getting these patients in and out as fast as possible. And so it's backwards as to what we probably should be doing. And look, it, it's not to say that there aren't some diseases that could be paid on a valued basis, which means the better that the doctor does the, the, in terms of treating patients and those outcomes, the better, uh, they'll be paid, right? That would be a value based care. Right. And certainly it could backfire like it did in kidney care. Remember they gave scorecards to these transplant centers and then the transplant center said, okay, well, we're going to stop. Um, they wanted to incentivize them to do the best work possible, but in the process, because healthcare is so complicated, you know, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a mess. And, and, and when you take those two things where the doctors and the patients don't have an incentive and you combine it with the fact that our system is, or what, what we really do is we have systems is so complicated. You know, you've got Medicare, you've got Medicaid, you've got private insurance. You've some of it's employer-based, some of it's individual. Most of it is most of the public doesn't even understand, you know, frankly, not even the public, but doctors don't even know oh, what no. they're going to be paid. Right. No. Okay. So it depends on, okay, does the person have this plan? How right. serious is their condition? How much time did I have to spend with them? And what, what metal plan? Are they a platinum member or are right. they a right. member? You know, none of, I mean, I mean, it's bonkers. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Doctors aren't in control at all of the structure no. of payment. Um, Most of the doctors and hospitals in our countries essentially work for private health oh, insurance. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. 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 It's, it, I mean, it's not, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, they get money for Medicare too, obviously. And, uh, and a, a big bulk of that, but that's just, I, you know, I don't know what percentage of it is, but, but certainly we have a group of corporations in this country that have, that don't, the insurance companies that don't really provide any tangible value to one's health other than well, they, they don't, they, they, they are in administration, right? Uh, and so they cut 15% off the top often. And that's a lot of money considering that about 18% of our whole economy is healthcare. And that's because we spend a ridiculous amount. Um, and, and it's incredibly inefficient. Yeah. And, and, and you can use so many different case studies to demonstrate this. Um, and, you know, you're using the case of renal failure, kidney failure here, but right. it's like, it's like the same old story in healthcare. Right. It's the same old story, but what makes kidney care again, so interesting Yeah, that it is paid for and paid there for. are only two treatment options. So here's, so let's, let's, do you have time for two more questions? I, yeah. Let's okay. Okay. So this is, you call this as an uh, experiment and, yes. you know, we'll probably have a fight again about universal health care as, you know, the elections come, I'm sure it'll come up. I mean, people really um, want it in this country and the people are really against it, but how does this experiment reflect on that entire notion of, you know, universal health care, sing single payer care? Is this a cautionary tale? Is this? It is a cautionary tale, but not in okay. the way that people might think. Um, you know, it's a cautionary tale that I think a lot of people would argue, and certainly you hear from politicians, that if we had Medicare for all, like they make it seem like everything would be okay. It was like Obama. For you, do you remember how much hope he gave us? And then it was like, it was like, we're gonna trans everybody, is, you know. Yeah. I was floating was on Obama. hope when Obama was elected. Yeah. And then he won it and he gave a speech and he's like, it's going to take some time to fix all the problems. We're like, what do you mean? What is this time you're talking about? Right. Um, I, I, I think that politicians make us feel like Medicare for all would be the panacea of our healthcare woes. 
right? But healthcare is more complicated than that. And who you who is paying is or how you pay somebody is just as important than who is paying. So right now we have this experiment and the who is the government, right? But how they pay for it. They're not incentivizing again, it's the dialysis clinics that are supposed to inform patients about transplant, right? Well, yeah, this might like logistically in terms of paperwork be an easier way to do it than to require doctors to do it and to document it, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's the how of how we have paid the metrics that we want to see. That is just as important as who is paying, right? I believe we should have a universal system, but I think what this this experiment shows is that healthcare is incredibly complicated and and it has to be done policies have to be created in a thoughtful way with the understanding that some unintended unintended consequences could happen um but that we should always be aiming in the direction of giving providers an incentive to do the best job they can. And certainly we're not doing that now. I'm sure you have a thousand doctor friends who are burnt out, a thousand nurse friends who are burnt out. Yeah. I mean, I just want the volume over value. I mean, I have a family member who was um, wanted to spend more time with patients, but was going to get docked in her bonus. Um, oh, yeah because the hospital, you know, administration was coming down on her and saying, Oh, you don't see enough patients a day. Um, well, well, yeah, I, I, like one that. of my friends, one yeah. of my friends is a, a psychiatrist, uh, at a hospital and she, she was told she wouldn't take the job at the hospital originally because they only wanted her to spend like 10 or 15 minutes with a patient or whatever. And she said, I, I, I can't do my job that way. Right. And so, you know, what I would say is yeah, that's really like for a psychiatrist. You yeah. I mean, 10 to 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, what I would say is people, people are very worried about, well, we don't want to be the Canada and we don't want to be a United Kingdom because, uh, you know, we don't want to wait. We don't want to die waiting for a procedure. Um, so the first thing I would say to that is every single one of these healthcare systems in the industrialized world is different. None of these two systems are the same. Canada is different than France. France is different than Germany. Germany doesn't even have a single payer system. They have a multi-payer system, but the insurance organizations that pay for it are actually nonprofit. Um, in France and Germany, the wait to see a specialist is less than the, in the United States, right? So, um, just because, um, this country or that country has more of a weight than we do, whether it be Canada or the UK or whatever it is, doesn't mean that we have to design ours exactly the same way. We can design ours different. Um, so there's that argument, right? And by the way, all of these countries, all of them spend on average a half to two thirds of what we spend on healthcare and all of their major metrics, including life expectancy, chronic disease, they blow us out of the water. Right. And I think that too, like the unaffordability, you know, right. I call us kind of the GoFundMe nation, like, because I always see it, like somebody gets sick and they have to create a GoFundMe account. And right. so that in combination with what you just said, how we're not blowing people out of the water. We should be right. like, for how much we're paying, we should be like doing a hell of a lot better, but we're not. So those two things, I feel like people are really, 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 and also 
the access to the internet, which some people hate because, you know, they say, don't do your own research. And you talked a little bit about that in your podcast. Like yeah. people are doing their own research online. Everybody has an internet connection out there. Like that ship has sailed. Medical student disease. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, but, but even for something like this, like you are going to be exposed to a lot more information. Um, yeah. Some will be wrong. Some will be right. But it's, it's, you know, the wild west. You're better out there. off seeing a doctor. <laughs> yeah. But I think, people are going to want a better system that puts them first. Like the demand for that is going to only increase. I feel like, um, you know, Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because, and I think like when you talked about, you know, you say it's complicated, the payment structure is super complicated. I mean, I remember one time I, looked at it, complicated. I was like, what the hell is this? Like, I don't get this. And I'm like thinking about somebody else reading it, you know, and I'm like, it's like a big curtain on it. But as that curtain yeah. starts to get lifted, you know, um, people are going to start to understand it more and then they're going to get mad. They're, they're going to get mad. That's the goal. The I goal so. that you and I both have, when, yeah. which is why I emailed you at the very beginning after yeah. you had my friend Elaine on, like, uh, yeah. let's get, let's get people angry together. Yes. Nothing, I'm would, make that. Me, nothing, nothing <laughs> would make me happier. Um, Hopefully we don't uh, end up on any. So if you're angry stuff. now, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> so, so th the other thing that they say when w with regards to universal care is that it would be unaffordable. Well, clearly what right. we're doing right now is unaffordable, <laughs> right. right? It's literally 18% of our whole economy. Yeah. I am now going to go to my primary care doctor and it was over, it was like a month and a half of waiting, right? So I'm still waiting. And by the way, I've got a great insurance plan. For primary care. Wow. Yeah, just for primary care was a month and a half of waiting, right? Uh, because there's a shortage of primary care. There, the hospital that that is that I'm affiliated with is literally advertising for doctors and nurses. They're like bonuses. We need you, right? But yeah. So um, but here's what I would say. Um it's ultimately a question of value, uh of values, right? Um Certainly, if we did absolutely nothing and we just started paying the same for everything that we're doing the way we're doing it now, like ten dollars for, you know, uh, uh, one Tylenol, well, you know, it, uh, yes, it would probably be unaffordable. But that's not the way we should do it, right? How we spend our money matters. How you spend it. Okay, right. So as a government now, we spend more on the military than the next what, like nine or ten nine or ten countries combined. Most of them who are our allies and pose absolutely no threat. Um, and so this was what eight hundred and fifty billion dollars, a lot of which the military didn't even ask for, but was just politics of, you know, let's save this shipyard because my constituents are working in that, right? Um, imagine for a second, if we were able to just take some of that 800, like, let's just say 200 billion of that 800 billion. So we had $600 billion that we were investing in our military that let's hopefully would, would become less pork like we would try to make uh, the healthcare system less pork barrel, right? Um, but if we were to invest two hundred, how many doctors could we pay? How many, how many doctors who primarily see Medicaid patients in California could we increase their pay so that they can become a homeowner one day, right? Uh, how many more nurses? And doctors, could we put out in the field so that I don't have to wait a month and a half to see a primary care physician who's a great physician, right? Um, it's a question of values, right? It's a question of how you spend your money. If we want to spend our money being the most efficient killers, and I'm not saying our military isn't important. It is. We see what's going on in Ukraine right now. Certainly there is a place for a strong military, but 
I think our society needs to balance it with the common welfare of its citizens. No, I, I, I would agree with you 100% on that. Um, some of my, some of my West Point classmates write, write you after, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, no, I think many, lot... many feel the same way, like very yeah. much so. So, um, yeah. The, the, the sad thing about our healthcare system is that there are a lot of patients and a lot of doctors and a lot of nurses that agree. Oh yeah. It's they just do. Yeah. organized. Yeah. I wanted to ask just to go back to this because um, I know Elaine Perlman came. She was on an earlier podcast um, talking about weightless zero and living donation, and that was a really interesting podcast. Yeah. But when we talk about incentives, like one idea, right, is to although it's uh, some people think it's questionable ethics wise, is to pay living donors, right? Yeah, they what should. What are your thoughts on that? Oh. They should. We should. Yeah, hey, uh, yeah. I mean, they absolutely should. Um, I I've started a a, a a different project that then wait then weightless zero. Pardon me. Um, and we can get into that uh, briefly. Actually, I'd love to chat about it quickly. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. But but uh, you know, look, we live in a country where we pay people to risk their lives all the time and we financially reward them whether it is the heroic police officers the the soldiers that we send out into battle and we're paying them and we're actually providing them with great benefits um what is so wrong with paying somebody to give the gift of life and by the way this doesn't even have to be a a monetary compensation. It could be, hey, in, in Iran, I think one of the things they do, the, Iran is the only country that actually has a market for kidneys. I don't know if Elaine talked to you about that. Um, I don't remember that. What do you, what do you yes. mean by that? So in Iran, living donors are compensated financially. And I believe not only are they compensated, they're given healthcare by the state for the rest of their life, from what I remember. And so you wouldn't even necessarily. So, okay, so I'm 42, right? Okay. If someone said to me, hey, if you give the gift of life, I am going to cover your healthcare expenses for the rest of your life. You're going to be brought into Medicare. I think a lot of people would be like, you know, that's a pretty darn good deal right? Certainly, this is not a minor surgery. There's a recovery time. Um, but most of the people who donated a kidney, if you ask them whether they would do it again, certainly Elaine, um, it's a transformative experience for them. Uh, and it becomes very much part of their life's mission. Um, so yes, it's it was an uncomfortable recovery, like some, you know, like many surgeries are. Um, but the average life expectancy of a of a kidney donor, a living kidney donor in our country, is actually greater than the general population, and that is because they are healthier to begin with. So yeah, you can want to donate a kidney, but the transplant center has got to say, okay, this is a good idea, <laughs> and and if you've got a lot of other problems, they're not going to take you as a donor. Right. And, and Elaine did a great job describing that. Like you have to be fit, you know, and, and yeah. healthy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Elaine, Elaine, um, I don't know how old she is, but I, she probably looks like a decade younger than she actually is. Uh, she's in, she's in great shape. Uh, she, uh, it's just a wonderful, vibrant, intelligent person. Um, yeah. and, and, um, and, 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 and a lot of the donors that I've met are, they just live a healthy lifestyle. Um, so, so yeah. So I, I think that they, I think that compensating donors would be the right thing to do. Um, a lot of people would say, well, that's going to explore poor, uh, poor people. Um, but those people, A, are not going to be taken 
for trans, they won't, they won't be taken by the transplant centers as living donors if they're not healthy. Right. And B, they could use the money. Right. And so, um, yeah, you can, you could say, Hey, there is some exploitation going on. Um, if you paid whatever, a hundred thousand dollars or $90,000. And people dollars. say that about how the military recruits. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, right? the most of the children of politicians aren't going off to fight. Yeah, it's war. not the rich trust fund babies usually. It's, like, it's yeah. not. But these people would be saving lives. And I have a feeling that if they did something like healthcare for the rest of your life, and they didn't make it just a monetary thing, then you would see more children of politicians doing it. Let's put it that way. Right. Yeah. Uh, particularly if it was safe. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to remember the majority of patients who are on dialysis are poor. Right. 80% of them are, are not point. working. So by doing this, yeah. you would also be helping a yeah. lot of patients get back to work. Yeah. Um, live longer. Yeah. And you would know as a person dang, I saved somebody's life. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a dilemma. I could see like how people could see both sides of it, you know? Um, but I sure. think, yeah, I, you know, but there's not going to be some like beautiful, pretty like solution that satisfies everybody. So, um, it, it's almost there's, like, <laughs> you're never going to find somebody who loves everything you do. Yeah. <laughs> That's for <Right>? sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wrote a, th this, I wrote a screenplay. It was it placed in the top half percent of the largest screenwriting contest in the world by the Academy of Motion Pictures. Oh wow! Right, and I was like, "Damn, I'm yeah. good!" Right? Yeah. And then I submitted it to another contest, and that that other contest, the the reader who wrote it was like, "Eh." <laughs> so <laughs> everybody's different, right? But what, were you, what stayed with you more? Was it the good review or the bad review? Um, it was knowing who I am and knowing it, it wasn't. Oh, you're too evolved. You're too evolved because <laughs> because usually I say people will like latch on. They'll get like great positive reviews. They'll get a major yeah. positive review from someone or something that really matters. But then they get one bad review. And a lot of people will just latch on to that bad review and be like, oh. Uh. So. You know, I, I, as I said, I was a filmmaker and I learned a long time ago to not to, to be open, to be open-minded, but uh, and to take people's feedback. But um, at the end of the day, you have to decide or you have to know in your heart this is good or this is not. And I think part of that is just experience. I think I'm much better now of knowing what's shit than I did 20 years ago when it comes to entertainment or whether a scene works or whether a video works or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. How do we get into this topic? Um, but <laughs> Well, I mean, if you're not doing something like puppies, um, if you're doing anything controversial, someone- Yeah, oh yeah, there's like always- film, someone will just be like, oh, that sucks because they just don't like your take on the controversy. Not, not exactly. Oh, exactly. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, th they, people sometimes don't know how to look at a, a subject outside the prism of their own subjectivity. Oh yeah. I guess look. you could say you could make a masterpiece Yep. if if the message of the masterpiece isn't good, people will be like, this is horrible. And we also live in a society where it actually pays to say that something is horrible. Right. Um, yeah. you know, if you, if you look at politicians, yeah, the best way they get airtime is to say, or the easiest way they get airtime is to say stuff that's controversial, something that grabs your attention, right? Something that allows you to scapegoat you know, whatever it may be, people who are gay or people who are black or people who are white, whatever it is, right? If you can be controversial 
uh, or ban a book or two, uh, he, he, the media is going to go, oh, we've got to get this person on television, right? And that is that just goes back to who we are in human nature. It's the very reason why we look at that ambulance and that car wreck on the side of the freeway and we have to slow down. They're just people, they're just manipulating who we are biologically. Yeah, there's yeah. no chance if there's a wreck on the side of the freeway that there's not going to be a traffic jam. No, of course not. Yeah. It's because everything in your, you know, you're like, okay, don't look, don't look, don't, I gotta look, I gotta look. Right. It's the same thing that keeps you glued every time CNN goes, this is breaking news. And then they tell you something that's clearly not breaking news. Right. It's drama. And to be honest, storytelling. Yeah. That's our weakness. Yeah. Yeah. Storytelling and um, being contrarian. I, and that's the same with anecdotes. I tell people like, like I run on the East River. I never see dolphins in the East River for most of my runs, but the one day I see dolphins on the East river, that's going to be the one that takes off and goes viral. Like there's dolphins in the East river, even though. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but this brings us to at least the last point that, you know, I happy to answer whatever questions you have for sure for as long as you want, because I enjoy these conversations, but I wanted to tell you, cause we're talking about storytelling. I am launching an initiative. Um, and it's about finding people living donors by telling them their story. And so you talk to Elaine and she is looking into getting financial compensation, right? For living donors and to solve the waitlist problem that way. So what I have learned is that there are a lot of good people out there who will donate an organ to somebody in need if they know there's a need. But the education about living donation in our country pretty much amounts to a DMV sticker, right? Um, it's horrible, right? And so most people don't know that there's a need. They don't know that it's safe. And so what I started doing with my colleague, Jen Benson, um, is we started to take on patients, the, you know, your average patients who just got on dialysis, right? And knowing that these patients are too sick and too fatigued to basically advocate for themselves, I took my storytelling talent, if you think I have any talent, and my filmmaking ability, um, and I basically did all the work for them, and I've been doing all the work for them. So there's a microsite feature on the Great Social Experiment, so that, and if you want, I can show you, um, so that every patient who needs it, can I share the screen here? I don't know, I don't know if this is going to be beneficial for our listeners, but at least you can see it. Um, every patient who wants it can have microsite if they're looking for a living donor. So here's the website, right? So how to help, right? And patients in need. So what you can see here is that these are all profiles of patients who are looking for a living donor. That's and great. I'm scrolling through this, right? And so here's this patient right here, uh, Laquea Goldring. And I met her when I was producing the series, the podcast series, and she testified before Congress. And I was like, oh, I should talk to her about it. And we became friends. She's a wonderful person. Um, and I told her, when you're ready, I will produce a video for you so that you can share your story. And when I, so that was the first part, right? The second chapter was I, I wanted to put resources on this website for patients who need it, right? And so there's a ton of patient resources that I have put on here if you click for patients, right? But one of those resources right here is called, it's create a microsite, 
right? And this was Lequay's idea. There are some organizations that do this, but they aren't as well designed as mine, I would say. So if you take a look at Lequay's profile right here, it's very simple. It's her name, her email, how people can try uh, to see if they're eligible to donate. And there's an, there's a video. And um, this allows her to speak directly to people who could be prospective donors. And, and in this video, she's not pleading with anybody, you know, please give me an organ or whatever. All she's doing is asking people to share her story. And look, living kidney donation is not for everybody, but it's very easy to share a story. And so somebody will, if, if they hear somebody's story, somebody will step forward. So, so basically what I started to do is I said, basically that uh, I'm going to help these patients share their story. And I've, and I've worked with a group of them. So if you come back here, there's multiple here and not every one of them I'm working with just because I don't have the bandwidth to do it. But what we do is we not only create the media, ongoing media, not just a, a, a first video that tells our story, but ongoing media that their community can share. So we basically work with Laquea's family and friends, and we meet with them and we said, here, we're going to do a campaign for her. And we're going to get her story out to as many people as possible. And what you can, what you find on the back end in terms of data is that there is a stark, stark difference. And I can actually show you, hold on one second, between those that have an organized campaign and those that do not. So here is, I'm opening a keynote for her, for people who are listening, because um, this is a presentation that we're now in we're now in discussions with multiple transplant centers to do a trial, but what you find, right, is that those that this is old data right here, but what you find is that those that actually have a campaign, look at the difference in the unique visitors they've got. Wow, compared to those that don't, it's a stark, stark yeah. difference, and and that is because a lot of these patients. They just don't have the energy to do it, right? But we in the United States have treated kidney failure as, okay, well, this is a medical problem, so there only has to be a medical solution. But we have absolutely no problem advertising Budweiser or Snickers or you know Versace on television and in the media. Well, what we have found is that if you you know, we're not lying. We're not, we're not spinning their story in a way that's different than what their story is. But if you actually tell their story, people will step forward. And so on this graph, you can see there's not just the amount of views, but the number of people who click on, how can I see if I'm eligible to donate? And so clicks to learn more. Look at that. Look at the difference. So right? those, what I'm looking at is a chart here. For yeah. those who have the organized campaign, there's a lot more clicks to learn more. So yeah, more. for people yeah. who have pe people like me doing the work for them. And we literally work for these patients. That's when amazing. We, when we talk to them at the beginning, yeah, we basically say everything that gets distributed and published online or in the newspaper, or whatever, it's going to be approved by you first. And so we're working for them, which is kind of the way I think it should be. Um, and what we have found is that someone, you know, like Jim Morgan here, right? Um, he's got a, not a huge group of advocates, but like a really, really hardcore uh, motivated group to get his story out there um, that we work with and we coach, he's been on, you know, the, the news, I think twice in the last month on the local news. 
Uh, and you can, you, I mean, you can just see the number of views, the number of people that, uh, and then we're also collecting donor information, right? So not only do we forward people on to the right transplant center, but now say there's 288 patients right here that you can see for this patient right here. Okay. Not every one of them is going to fill out the form to go to the next step. But what I can tell you is that over 130 people have. 130 people. And that's not even the most up-to-date figure. That's just what I remember from like last week, right? And so you not certainly not every single one of them is going to be able to donate. And some of them will learn about what's involved in donation, not just the surgery, but the, you know, you're gonna have to take time off from work. Um, people have kids and there's childcare. Um, but there's going to be, let's just say that, you know, out of for this specific patient right here, I'm not gonna say the person's name, let's say uh 10% of them are good candidates to donate, right? Well, one of them will donate and maybe nine of them really don't even know who this guy was, but they saw a story and they said, hey, I'd like to help save somebody's life. Well, those nine other people can now, if they so choose, get repurposed and donate to somebody else. Right. See where this is going? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And so this is a, a pilot program that we're on the verge of getting into a center or two right now. This is um, great. Yeah. So what we need though, and so this is, this is going to be my call to action for people who are listening. Okay. Um, some of these patients have better, what I call advocates than others, right? The community of close family and friends, some of them, um, you know, and it's, it's sometimes to no fault of their own. You know, you, your family is busy working, your family, you know, they just, they've got, you know, four mouths to feed maybe, right? <clears throat> um, so some of them have a stronger group of advocates than others. And so what I'm about to do is launch a video within the next month, probably, um, which will explain to anybody who watches it, the world, that we're looking for non-direct advocates, right? So you think of the non-direct donor, <clears throat> my voice is going, the non-direct donor will donate to somebody they don't know and they don't want anything in return. Well, what if you had a thousand people across the country or 2000 people across the country that were sharing these people's stories, let's say once a week, that wanted nothing in return other than maybe they got a transplant themselves. Maybe they're a living donor and believe in the cause. And we were able to put people on different teams. So John Doe is doing wonderful this week. He's got a ton of people have come forward, but maybe Jane Doe <clears throat> isn't getting much traffic to no fault of her own and certainly to no fault of the media creators, right? Maybe we put 20 other people on her team. You get it? She gets transplanted. Then we no, can take I mean, those it's, it's a great and idea. repurpose them somewhere else. So there's a lot of ways that we can attack this problem. Yeah. The transplant centers and the government ultimately have to understand that for, for whatever reason, transplantation is that one thing in our country in the medical system where the hospital isn't a one-stop shop where they can just fix it. You need that added, you know, element, which is you need a donor and, and these centers are not, some of them have made efforts to, to do this like in a not so thorough way um, where they have like, you know, there's organizations or centers where they have many, many patients, like a thousand patients or 1500. And they're like, all right, here's your business card <laughs> with your website, but nobody's going to go to a website. As you can see from these stats, if they don't know it exists. And so 
if you are interested, depending on when you listen to this, if uh, the program, you'll see the program on my website once I launch it. But if, if you are on my website before I launch the program, please send me an email if you want to participate and be an advocate. Um, and then I will keep you, I'll save your information and I will definitely email you when we're ready to launch. And David, just, I, I'm going to include your website, but in case folks just want to listen to it and write it down, do you mind just saying it? The great social experiment.net. That's the great social experiment.net. Dot net. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Not dot com. I couldn't afford the dot com. <laughs> Well, there's all different. I, dot I totally like, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, it used to just be just.com and now it's uh and now it's everything. Yeah. Someone told me like the dot com is actually not like the coolest one. Like if you're in the startup world, it's like, oh, dot com. Like yeah, I like who are yeah, you? I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um Thank I enjoyed it. So I learned much. a lot. Um, and I look forward to sharing your website. Uh, I think this initiative that you're working on is fantastic. And um, yeah, I'll probably stay in touch. I'll be in touch over email anyways, but you better. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. Um, and yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. I got to hop into a meeting now, but um, this is all really great stuff. And I, I always say like, I learned so much from you and this, and cause this is just an area where I'm like completely just don't know anything. So for me, it was just really awesome to kind of learn and, and, you know. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks again, David. Bye-bye. Uh All right. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's episode. Please consider sharing it if you liked it or know someone who might like it, subscribing to the podcast and or subscribe to the newsletter. You can find the sign up link in the podcast description uh, or if you visit my website, bloomingwellness.com, it conveniently pops up for y'all. And I encourage all of you to listen to David's podcast, The Great Social Experiment, which I will link to in the podcast episode description and my blog. It's very well done. And it's a very creative way to present a public health topic, uh, one that is both timely, right? Universal health care yet more obscure in that not that many people know or knew about universal health care and kidney disease. All right, and now it's quote time. Uh, the ending quote, this one is from Plutarch, Plutarch, and here it is. Health is precious, but volatile. I would agree. Uh, Plutarch was a vegetarian, totally random trivia there, uh, but I think he was a vegetarian for ethical reasons, not, you know, health reasons, for example. Maybe he ate fish, though. I don't know. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like, a lot of vegetarians will say, I don't eat meat, but I eat fish. <laughs> yeah, you do, you girl. As if the fish don't matter, you know, like, uh, eat those fish, get rid of those fish. But you never hear that about cows or bunnies. You don't, you would never hear someone say, yeah, I don't eat meat, but I eat bunnies, but I eat bunnies. You won't, you'll never hear that. No one says that, but, but, but I eat fish. Like <laughs> get rid of those fish, those awful fish. Uh, anyways, life ain't fair. Fish, bunnies, life is not fair. All right. So on that honest note, life is not fair. I uh, hope to see you guys here next time. Uh, for now, so long and go out there and have a great day. Bye-bye.